السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه So I'm not going to address politics just yet in this session but um, if you are interested in hearing more about that inshallah there is a session later today that you're welcome to come to but I wanted to address the topic at hand we're talking inclusive or exclusive what do our spaces look like? How do we interact with different groups that may not share our beliefs or values? And how do we position ourselves in those spaces? Because of course, in politics, but also in your work, and whether it's MSA or different social organizations, we find ourselves wanting to figure out how, how do we understand allyship? Who do we work with? Is it haram to work with certain groups? And it's really important for us to think of this on various planes. So first, there's the theoretical side of things. There's us being internally consistent and clear with where we stand on various issues. And, that, you know, and there's one element of that, being proud of our Muslim identity, having a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are deeper philosophical foundations that I want us to kind of explore today, inshallah, and, and make sure that we understand so that we know where to position ourselves. And once we have that theoretical framework, we're then able to look at the practical. And we're able to face it with a confidence, inshallah, and a clarity because we know where we're coming from theoretically and philosophically. So I want to talk a little bit about that. All right, so when we think of our Islam, where it sits within the world and the history of civilization, where it sits philosophically, it's important for us to consider something called epistemology. Okay, who's heard that word before? Okay. Good, at least a couple people. Epistemology is essentially how we know what we know. So we find ourselves, we grew up in a society, we're socialized to know that certain norms, you know, certain things are appropriate to do, certain things aren't, certain things are appropriate to say, certain things aren't. And especially in some college campuses, right, we, there, there's always a language you're allowed to use when you talk about certain things and certain people and topics and other words that you can't use, otherwise you're going to be kind of shamed or looked at like you don't belong or you don't understand the cues and the norms of how things operate. But those norms were kind of established before we got there. And there are underlying assumptions for us as a society when we grow up as Americans, when we grow up in a Western context, not necessarily better or worse, but different than how others may think elsewhere. And that comes from generations of history that we may not even realize we're being socialized into. So for example, in an American context, who, who were some of the influential philosophers and theorists that we learn about, whether it was in history or in, in school, right? <coughs> Who's heard of John Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, right? These are people that we learned shaped what democracy is, taught us what, you know, rule of law, separation of powers. We grew up learning these things to be the philosophical foundation of our society. And we saw them to be valuable principles that shaped the system of government we live under, the society and the values that we share. But maybe we never actually realized that that is one version of many versions across human history of the way we think about society and the, and the way we structure society. So number one, it's important for us to recognize, all right, we actually happen to be born into a bubble that could have been very different and that had intentionality in what was passed on or what we took on and were socialized into believing. Are you guys with me? We're still together? Okay. So this is a little abstract and complex, so I know it's, it's going to be hard to follow. But inshallah, I look forward to also clarifying in the Q&A, so keep any questions in mind. All right, so we find ourselves here, and then we, we, when we interact on a practical level, sometimes we face questions like, how are we going to interact with the LGBTQ community? Is it haram to visit a church? To, to do things like this, right? But really, the conversations we're having on the ground are actually resulting from the conclusion of these larger theoretical frameworks and the clashes that may exist amongst various civilizations in the ways that they frame the world. So we're having this conversation in the, on the nitty gritty, or maybe the way people perceive women in Islam. When someone walks into a masjid and they see women standing in the back, 
and someone asks you, why do y'all treat your women like this? Or it doesn't make sense to me. Like, why do women have to stand in the back? And they're having this conversation, and we may find ourselves stuck. Like, I, maybe internally, I don't even know why, why this is the case. Maybe that's one of the things that, makes my, that hits my iman. I don't know. But we, what we don't realize sometimes is that that is a conversation that has to do with the conclusion and the outcomes of these broader theoretical uh, civilizational uh, worldviews and not necessarily the nitty gritty. Because the nitty gritty of it later, the outcome of it, is bound to disagree, right? If you start from a different place, you're gonna find yourself with different outcomes. So finding uh, where we fit within that. So all right, we, we st I mentioned epistemology. How do we know what we know? In an Islamic framework, we have various sources of knowledge, okay? So when we go on a philosophical level and talk about knowledge, there are actually sources identified, right? We have three sources of knowledge as Muslims. We have, does anyone know? Can anyone name one? Okay, I heard Quran, so yeah. Khabar uh, al-Sadiq, okay, so I'll, essentially um, honest um, retelling, okay, whether that's the Quran, whether that's the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu We also have sensory knowledge, okay? Islam, Muslim philosophers, accepted multiple sources of knowledge, and, and logic actually was an important piece of this too. So we have logical reasoning, we have sensory knowledge, and we also have al-khabar al-sadiq, okay? So those are three, three pillars of how we come to understand our world. So when we have a conversation, all right, how do we come to understand uh, rizq, wealth? We can understand it in, in a sensory way, our experiences. We can understand it rationally, but we also connect it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a divine and a larger idea of how the world came to be. And that's why our foundation on that principle particularly is that it is, comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It's not just something that you earn. The poor aren't just lazy and the rich aren't you know, necessarily wealthy for many reasons, but um, because we believe that it fundamentally comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, we live in a context and in a society and in a framework that only relies on two sources of knowledge. Like at Western philosophy, broadly speaking, okay? Sensory information, so we perceive our world through our five senses, and logic, reasoning. So how do we then expect to arrive at the same place on various social matters, on any kind of question, when we are starting with a foundation where there's an entire pillar that's not even existent, that's not considered a valid source of knowledge? So it's important to position ourselves in realizing, wow, okay, I'm, I find myself growing up in a society where the larger philosophical conversations about values, what's right and wrong, don't actually include a major element that's the foundation of my faith. So of course, then later, the outcomes of that are going to disagree with, one, with each other, and, and we may find ourselves confused because we can't even use, we're trying to answer questions about our deen on the terms of a different philosophical way of thinking. All right, so that's one, one thing I wanted to convey. The other thing is a lot of these things over time, over history, <clears throat> have been about power. So you guys know nation state is more of a modern concept, right? We have these countries and they kind of have arbitrary lines and they have a flag and maybe, you know, share a culture. But before, civilization was different. It was actually more ideological than perhaps today. And in the time with the Greco-Romans, we had Muslim philosophers responding to many of their arguments. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exist or not? What does he look like? What is the afterlife? What, you know, what is judgment? Then we, have some of the, we had some of the brightest Islamic minds challenging the Greco-Romans on their philosophies because they came from different foundations when it came to how they related to the divine or how they found themselves. So when now, today, when we, base, you know, when we learn history, we start with what? Like Roman Greek history, we learn about the, you know, the gods and the myths and whatever. And those things shape how we think about things today. They're so embedded in our society. They're part of our culture, right? When we see different movies and references, you could probably, some of you guys in the audience might know all the names and all their powers and whatever. But it's important to recognize the influence of these things that didn't necessarily originate from our tradition, 
but that, in, in a sense, infiltrate our thoughts and shape the way we think in ways we're not even aware of. So starting to identify those things is critical and positioning ourselves to know, all right, if I'm coming in with an Islamic framework, what are the things that are consistent and, and are fine? Because not everything is necessarily wrong just because it's different. And what are the things that are at odds on a foundational level that lead me to have doubts about my deen? Or that lead me to have questions and clashes that I can't really pin the source of, but I know something is off. And it's either going to hurt my iman and kill my iman, or I'm going to isolate myself and I'm not going to know how to engage with society. So, so I wanted to, to kind of set some of that foundation for us. And then how does that inform the practical? So one of the important things, um, you know, from a philosophical perspective, and, and, and when I mentioned that it's also about power, these are movements that were, then became things people propagated. So they had founders, you know, when it comes to something like, all right, who's heard of liberalism? Everyone knows what liberalism is. Maybe, maybe you think you know what liberalism is. But we use it as a term where it's like, all right, it's some political leaning, you know, you're on some spectrum of liberal and conservative. But liberalism itself was one of these philosophies that was founded at a certain historical point. And we learn, I mean, many of us know about, you know, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, right? And that influenced generations later that trickled down to our thoughts and our understandings. Why is that important? Because we engage with liberalism today in many ways on the ground that could potentially be at odds with our Islam without realizing it. And another really important piece about liberalism, and, and liberalism is one example, there are many philosophical kind of waves that influence our thought. At its core, there is no ultimate source of truth. Think about that. So we're Muslims, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Qur'an and the Sunnah are the ultimate source of truth, right? We believe there is a truth, capital T, truth. And maybe, you know, we're trying to come to, to some understanding of what that is, to come as close as we can. But we know, we believe there's one God, and one God created this earth, and that is the truth. But the morality that we grew up being socialized into and understanding through our society is based in a framework that doesn't believe there's a truth. It's all relative. If this makes you feel good, it's fine. If you don't hurt me, it's fine. Your truth, you know, you do you. It's your truth, right? And, and if you are able to kind of find a way to argue your conclusion, it's just as valid and just as good as mine, even if it's the opposite. So it's important for us to realize if these are the influences morally around us, and, and not necessarily in a way that's combative, it's just what it is. And that the foundation of that doesn't acknowledge the existence of one source of truth, an ultimate source of truth, then of course we're going to find ourselves questioning the existence of God. And, and finding fillers for that perhaps. In our society, choice is a big one, right? Individualism, censoring the self, become ways that we try to get around this. And we ultimately suffer for it because the conclusions move us further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I wanted to paint that theoretical context for ourselves because then, all right, inclusive or exclusive, what kind of community do we build? How do we engage with different groups? <clears throat> we can't begin to understand and have clarity on how, in a practical sense, we engage when we don't know how to position ourselves morally when we don't know what the basic foundational things that we disagree with perhaps or that are different for us and that are important for us to keep in mind and to correct mentally in the various things we're being exposed to. And if any of you, you know, if any of you are taking a philosophy course or history, or taking, you know, classes in history, even political science, in any Western university or institution, you are going to confront this stuff. Even actually, even in the sciences, right? When we talk about evolution and this and that and what the arguments are, so, so that's uh, the theoretical side of things. All right, so how does that inform the practical? So as you guys know, in a lot of uh, these social justice circles, we tend to be driven by, well, okay, I'll, I'll comment on it in a second, but some of the language we hear, I mentioned, you know, you do you. Uh, we hear, I'm not gonna, you know, educate you, educate yourself, right? It's not my job to teach you your ignorance. <laughs> 
And I, and I spent a lot of time actually trying to break this down because something about it didn't sit well with me when I thought of the example the Prophet ﷺ. Is that something the Prophet ﷺ would say? And why do I find myself kind of adopting this language, this like moral framework of operating that essentially stems from liberalism in a way that I thought would promote social justice? And many of us, this is the language that exists on our campuses for the most part. So I'm sure many of you have heard this before and have been exposed to it. So then the question becomes, all right, what are those moral underpinnings? And when I can connect it to some theoretical framework, I can understand that actually maybe it is my job. Maybe when the Prophet ﷺ showed us an example of what da'wah looks like, that that did require struggle. And it wasn't all about me. Because my center of truth is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not my preferences, not how I feel, because it's not relative. And someone's ignorance may actually be a circumstance of society because I approach the issue not through anger, not through a centering of myself and, and my feelings, but through a compassion that becomes a source of positivity that originates from that, cent that one source of truth. Because my foundation, my epistemological foundation, is not just how I perceive the world through my mind and through my senses, but it also is based in a moral framework that corrects the way I operate. That third pillar, right? So it's all connected. Um, and inshallah, we can continue to have a conversation. I want to make sure I provide time to hear from you guys too and, and have a Q&A kind of on what the practical looks like. But it's so important to me that, that we take away, that we're, you know, we fall within this theoretical positioning that impacts the practical, and so we can come from it, we can be models in what compassionate social justice looks like, as opposed to kind of what we, we already see on college campuses and whatnot, that's a little more tit for tat. And then we end up just as bad as the people who maybe oppressed us in the first place, right? Because we're driven by anger and can be destructive too. So how do we center the Prophet وسلم, as an example and a model for us and not underestimate, by the way, that the Sahaba, that, that the Tabi'een faced their own um, you know, philosophical challenges and had to respond to a lot of this. Our tradition has many answers to a lot of these questions about you know, whether God exists and um, why we do things a certain way and our women and this and that. Because these are philosophical waves over time and history that come and go. And liberalism is just one. There are so many. I can tell you for another example real quick. Skepticism, okay, that's one of the ways that the history today, it's how we study history, okay? It's, it's essentially, rather than accepting truth based on different sources at face value, you question the source first. So that for us creates a crisis with hadith, for example. When we want to accept the narrations of the Prophet and we have our own methodology that's really rigorous, and as we know, you know, the scholars have spent years putting together and ensuring the sources were valid, but today, it's, if it's not going to fit some kind of Western metric of historicity, of, of validity, it's not valid. And so then you, if you question hadith and the sunnah, our foundation crumbles. And we can't justify certain things that we stand on. So there, again, being aware of those kind of philosophical influences, foundational influences, I should say, that impact the way that we relate to the world and then realizing how much they, they affect us and our iman potentially when we interact in a practical day-to-day, -day, figuring out whether we do work with certain groups or not, uh, whether we can feel comfortable in our own skin as Muslims on a college campus when a professor may be saying things that are absolutely absurd, uh, and, and, and coming to the source of that problem so that inshallah it doesn't you know, harm our iman in the process uh, and that we can be a source of compassion and light for others. So look forward to engaging and answering questions inshallah. Thank you.